Okay, so in the second episode of our Force and Momentum series, we are going to look at the conservation of momentum, one of the most important, if not the most important, conservation law that we really have in physics. Let's get into it. So we know from what we talked about in the last episode that the force is equal to the change in momentum divided by the change in time whenever basically an, an object interacts with another object and undergoes a change in momentum. And we also know from Newton's third law that the force, you know, in an interaction between two objects, the force that object one exerts on it is equal, well, the force exerted on object one is equal and opposite to the force exerted on object two. So for every reaction force, there is an equal and opposite reaction force. So the, the magnitude of the forces is equal, but they're in opposite directions. That's where the negative sign comes from. So if we take these two relationships here, we can, and, and basically substitute I have to do my substitute this one into this relationship here. We get that uh, delta P1 over delta T is equal to minus delta P2 over delta T my little tail on the T so we don't confuse it with the plus sign. Now we can see hopefully easily there that the delta T's is the same on both sides so they cancel out because the two objects are interacting so the length of that interaction is going to be the same for both objects. So that means that delta P1, did mean to do that, uh, delta P1 is equal to minus delta P2, and then if we rearrange that with a little bit of algebra and both, both terms to the same side, we get delta P1, it's minus on that side, so we add it to this side, plus delta P2 is equal to zero. So what exactly is this formula telling us? Well, what it's telling us is the total change in momentum in any interaction between two objects, and basically we're talking here generally about a collision or an explosion, is zero, i.e. momentum is conserved. It cannot be created or destroyed. Or even put more simpler, that the total initial momentum will always equal the total final momentum. And this is, you know... Conservation of energy we've learned about, but energy sort of isn't conserved in, say, an inelastic collision as opposed to an elastic collision. It's only conserved in an elastic collision, or at least kinetic energy is only conserved in an elastic collision. Um, we've learned about, you know, energy is also interchangeably with mass, which is what happens, you know, due to Einstein's E equals MC squared relationship, which says energy and mass can sort of interchange with each other. So mass isn't quite conserved and energy isn't quite conserved. It's this sort of combined total of the two. But momentum is a universal law of conservation. Momentum is always conserved. So what we need to do with this is basically use this to solve some problems in one and two dimensions and also to interpret or to analyze multi-image representations of momentum um, and we will go and look at that in the next slide. Okay, so let's look at a, a multi-image representation first. So these diagrams basically just represent a photo taken overhead of two pucks. And basically an image is taken at a, a constant time rate. So basically the, the time between each image can be regarded as constant. So we can basically then interpret information about their velocity because we know it's happening at a constant time interval. We, we touched on multi-image photographs in the last, in the projectile motion topic. 
So, um, the motion of two pucks on an air table is shown in the multi-image diagram below. The mass of puck A is 2m and the mass of puck B is m. So it's not giving us an actual value here. It's just saying it's m, but we know that puck A is twice the mass of puck B. Puck A is initially moving in the direction shown before it collides with puck B, which is initially stationary. After the collision, the pucks move in the direction shown. The time between each image is constant. On the diagram above, draw and label momentum vectors for each of the two pucks after the collision. So the momentum for, sorry, I'll just go back to a pen. The uh, final momentum here for puck A, we can just signify there. And we go for basically two flashes because it's got twice the mass. So, um, you know, remembering momentum is equal to m times v. So in this case, it's going to be 2mv. So we can show that by going two lots. Whereas down here, the blue puck, not a very straight line, sorry, is going to have its momentum there. And that will only go for one flash because that's just equal to mv. So this is, let's label it to be, because I think it says label the momentum vectors. So this is P, F, <coughs> puck A, sorry. <coughs> sorry, coughed again. And this one is P, F for puck B. So that's part A, pretty straightforward. And then in part B, it says, with the aid of a vector diagram, determine whether or not momentum is conserved in the collision of puck A and puck B. Justify your answer. So this is where we need to do a vector diagram. So let's just think, initially puck A, again, it's got a mass of 2m, so we go for two flashes to show that. And there is the momentum for the initial momentum of puck a. Now, to work out the total final momentum, we have to do um, basically P final of A plus P final of B. And so basically when we add those two together, this one goes down here, we've got a line that's parallel and the same length. So there is P, F, B. We've added that to P, A. And then we can work out that the total final momentum of both pucks is given there. Now we can see here hopefully, that P, the total, or well, the initial momentum of A, which was the total initial momentum, goes one, two, three, four lines um, in a horizontal. The total final momentum after the collision goes one, two, three, four lines along a horizontal. So that we can say that, um, just hang on a sec. So yeah, I've just put that answer in words. The total initial momentum vector, PIA, this vector here, is equal in length and direction to the total final momentum vector, PTF, or I could have called that PA plus BF, but it doesn't really matter. This vector here, showing momentum is conserved. Now it's important here, it says justify your answer. Um, if you just drew this vector here and you just drew this vector here, you potentially would have got only, I think, I can forget if this is, I can't quite see on my screen whether it's three marks or four marks, but you might have only got one or two marks for that question. It is really important when it says justify your answer that you have something there written in words to justify your answer. Okay, let's go and look at another conservation of momentum problem. 
So, let's read through the question. When playing the game of pool, players may use the white cue ball to collide with the coloured ball and then have these balls move in different directions. The photograph shows a white cue ball about to collide slightly off centre with an orange ball. The mass of each of these two balls is 0.17 kilograms. Before the collision, the white cue ball moved at a speed V and the orange ball was stationary. After the collision, the white cue ball moved with a speed of 0.28 metres per second and the orange ball moved at a, with a speed of 0.53 metres per second. When viewed from above the direction of the two balls before and after the collision as shown in the diagrams below. So I've got the white ball coming in about to hit the orange. The orange is going to shoot off this way. The white's going to go this way. So this is represented in the diagram. Now, if you're particularly switched on, you'll go 62 degrees above the horizontal, 28 degrees below the horizontal, 28 plus 62 is 90 degrees. So we are dealing with a right angle triangle here. And in the test or exam, you'll always either get an equilateral triangle, so they're all sides are all angles are 60, so all sides are the same length, or you'll get a right angle triangle that you can solve using simple trigonometry. So it says, using the law of conservation of momentum, determine the speed of the white cube ball before the collision. So whenever you get these problems, divide them up into what happened before and what happened afterwards. So we know that the total, we know, well, Let's think about it. We know initial momentum. Let's think about that over this side. And then on this other side, let's think about final momentum. And we know those two things need to be equal. So the initial momentum Pi is equal to mi times by vi, um, which is going to be equal to 0.17 vi. And we don't know vi at the moment. We'll leave that. But we do know that this total initial momentum, Pi, is going to be equal to whatever the total final momentum is. So let's work out the total final momentum. We know that the Momentum of the, let's do the white ball first, is going to be equal to um, its mass, which is 0 0.17, times by, uh, the white ball moves with a speed of 0 0.28 metres per second, and I'll work that out in a sec, I'll grab my calculator. But the momentum of the orange ball is going to equal 0 0.17, because they weigh the same, times 0 0.53, which is going to be equal to that. So let me just pause and work those two out on the calculator. So I quickly work that out. Uh, the white ball is 0 0.0476, and the white ball is 0 0.90. 0.0901. So um, we're going to add these together though vectorially and I'm just going to use the diagram up here to do that. So the white ball has less momentum. Not that it really matters so I'll use that vector there for the momentum of the white ball. And then we're going to add onto it the momentum of the orange ball which is going to come across like that. Sorry, the line's not very straight. That's the orange. And the total momentum of those two will be across like that. That'll be a right angle triangle there. So that's our total momentum. So we can just use Pythag. And I think it says speed of the ball. So we don't need to worry about direction because speed, remember, um, velocity is the vector. Speed is the scalar. We don't need to worry about um, velocity. That line, total momentum line, should have been horizontal, actually. But we won't worry too much about that because it has to be in the same direction as before. We just say that's close enough. So 
to add those two things up using Pythag, P T O tool is equal to the square root of 0 0.0476 squared plus 0 0.0901 squared. And we'll just quickly pause and go to the calculator. So we get an answer there of 0 0.102 um, kilograms, meters per second, but we don't worry too much about the units at the moment. So um, that's the total initial momentum. We know that the, so that's the total final momentum. We know the total final momentum, final momentum must equal the total initial momentum. So basically we can substitute that number there into there so we get left with back on the initial side 0 0.102 equals 0.17 vi um, so we can basically divide both sides by 0.17 to get vi and we get VI is equal to naught point six zero meters per second. So that's the process to do a couple of different conservation of momentum problems. Um, let's look at the last part of conservation of momentum now. So finally, for this topic, we're going to um, use the concept of well, the conservation of momentum can be used to explain the propulsion of spacecraft, ion thrusters, and solar sails. And then basically, we're going to you need to be able to use the conservation of momentum to describe and explain the change in momentum and acceleration of spacecraft due to the emission of gas particles or ionized particles. We'll go through that in a sec. Use conservation of momentum to describe and explain how the reflection of particles of light photons can be used to accelerate a solar sail. We'll go through that. And this last one I think should have been a dot point. My formatting went wrong. Use vector diagrams to compare the acceleration of spacecraft using a solar sail where the photons are reflected with acceleration of spacecraft um, of a spacecraft and using a solar sail where the photons are absorbed. So let's firstly just look at a emission of gas from a, a spacecraft like a traditional rocket and what we have here is this, as this rocket takes off it expels higher gas hot gas at high velocity and that that gas or that fuel has a momentum basically downwards in that direction and that causes the rocket to gain, to gain equal and opposite momentum, well, equal momentum in the opposite direction. So as the gas particles get forced downwards out the back of the motor, they have a certain momentum, the rocket will gather equal and opposite momentum. Now, usually this fuel is very light, but moving at very, very high velocity, the mass of the rocket is much greater, so it won't move at the same velocity as the fuel, it'll move at a much lower, velocity but basically the product of the mass and the velocity which is momentum of the fuel will be equal to the product of the mass and velocity which is the momentum of the rocket. So the next application we want to look at is an iron thruster and this is used in um, as a method of propulsion in a number of rockets and rather than burning gas um, to, to heat it up and cause it to be released at high velocity, they put the xenon ions into a strong electric field. And again, we'll explore electric fields in more detail later. But at the moment, we just need to know that opposite charges attract, like charges repel. Um, xenon is a very, very heavy ion, which means that when it's accelerated, it will have a larger momentum, so it makes it particularly suitable for this application. So the xenon ions get put into this electric field, if you like, at the within the, the rocket motor, and it causes these to accelerate at high speed away from the positive light charge towards the negative, but this negative 
electrode basically lets the, you know, it's like a screen, so the, the ions can actually pass out the back of the rocket. So those, um, those ions will basically go, have a momentum going this way, and that will cause the rocket or the satellite to gain equal momentum in the, I think we'll do like a satellite here because usually this is used in satellites as a form of space propulsion. So yeah, so it's just another way of firing um, particles out the back, or out one direction to um, force the rocket through conservation and momentum to go in the opposite direction. So yeah, that's an ion thruster. And as I said, we'll explore in more detail in the next topic, electric fields and all that sort of thing. But I think at the moment that that should, you know, that I think that sits fairly well with what you have a, a basic understanding of electrostatic charge. So a solar sail is like a big screen, um, usually like a big alfoil screen or something like that, that you can attach to a satellite or to a spacecraft, particularly one heading deep into space. And basically they can be used to accelerate that spacecraft. And let's explain a little bit about how that happens. Firstly, we need to just know briefly about the concept of a photon. And photons are little packets of light and they have momentum. In topic three, light and the atoms, we explore photons in much more detail. But at the moment, we can just think of them as like little tiny packets of light. And they, light doesn't have a mass, um, but it does have momentum. So because light has momentum, it is able to transfer that momentum to an object that it strikes. So these um, s satellites or spacecraft have these solar sails that you can shine basically light either from the sun or um, say from a laser beam focused in on it. And that light will just keep causing the spacecraft to accelerate in space where there's no air resistance and that sort of thing. So they have um, great potential. For example, um, one way you could use them is you could put them into, build them into sort of satellites, um, maybe ones that are, are designed to fold out as the satellite reaches the end of its life. And then you could shine a high intensity laser at that satellite and the the momentum of those photons coming from that laser would help push it out of Earth's orbit so it doesn't potentially become space junk that can have all sorts of implications. Um, you know, we've already put something like 25 or 30,000 pieces of junk into space and it's becoming increasingly hard to find orbits to put things that we want to put up that aren't in danger due to our own space junk. Anyway, I go a little off task here. What we need to know about is the difference between a solar sail that can absorb light that hits it and one that can reflect light. So let's look at absorption first. Often we indicate a photon with one of these squiggly arrows. We'll come back to this later in the year. And we can think of this photon having momentum Pi. If it is absorbed by this solar sail, it basically just comes to a stop. And that means it's change in momentum, just find the rope. Its change in momentum of the solar sail will be equal to the final momentum minus the initial momentum, which would be equal to basically minus Pi. So minus Pi, if you like, is going to be in that direction. So I should draw that the same length as the other side. So that means that the spacecraft will gain equal and opposite momentum in the opposite, let's just go spacecraft, in the opposite direction. So it will gain momentum equal and opposite to Pi if it's absorbed. However, if we have a solar sail that can reflect a photon, the change in momentum is now equal to the final momentum, which in this case will be minus Pi, minus the initial momentum, which is Pi, which will equal minus 2Pi. So twice the momentum of the initial. So in a sense, the final momentum becomes double 
well, the change in momentum becomes double. Oh, hang on. Let's just, sorry, I've jumped ahead a step there. Let's just go to the rubber. The, um, I'll try and keep that consistent with the last one. The, let's draw the two arrows for this way. So there we've got minus two PI made up of those two lines. Basically, when we subtract um, PI from it, um, we've got, yeah, well, both of them are going to be minus PI, minus PI. So that means that the spacecraft in this case will gain two, twice the initial momentum in the opposite direction is what will get given to the spacecraft. And maybe I should be a bit more consistent, say so here, this is the, the, the initial momentum of the spacecraft. Uh, the initial momentum of the photon will be equal to the momentum of the spacecraft. Um, I think you know what I mean there. So we need to, that's where we explain the difference between reflected and absorbed photons. Um, and we've used little vector diagrams just in one direction to do that. If it was in two dimensions, it would be like the vector diagrams that we did in previous questions. So that is it for force and momentum. Cheers.